Father God, Lord, we just want to come to you right now. Lord, confessing our need of you. Father, really we don't have anything to bring. We have a small amount. Lord, we have ourselves. But Lord, we just want to bring that to you and confess our, in, our inadequacy before you. Lord, we want to depend completely upon you and trust completely in you. And Lord, especially tonight as we are in your word, Lord, as Dee and I are endeavoring to to bring your words to your people, God, we just ask for self to be hidden in you. God, we don't want us to shine through. We want a picture of Jesus to be seen. So Lord, we just commit the keeping of our souls to you and just pray that you will bless and feed us all with your word this evening. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So the topic we're covering this evening is a topic entitled Bad Religion. I assure you we're not going to be ranting, gossiping, or running down anyone else. I assure you of this. But this is just kind of a simple term to kind of define the issue that we see regularly within Adventism, uh, with, our, with what our young people are wrestling with. But this is not an Adventist problem. This is just a humanity problem, right? How many people here have had run-ins with folks who claim to know Jesus but don't really behave like Jesus? They're kind of maybe a little cranky, a little short, a little hard to be around, hard to deal with, and um, cause difficulties for us who are Christians because people say, look, I want nothing to do with Jesus because I met people who claim to know Jesus and were really crusty, difficult, cantankerous people to be around. Well, our young people are wrestling with this because it's just an overarching issue that our movement isn't immune to. And I think that the more, the more reforms that a movement may have the more prone our humanity can be to want to control the people around us um, and to want them to be towing the line on a policy of this or this. Now, I say this being abundantly clear that I think the reforms are a great blessing to our movement and are relational in nature, not something that we're intended to control another human being. That wasn't the point of them. The point of the reforms was to ensure that there were no barriers, no hindrances, no distractions to interfere with our relationship with God. The things we put in our body directly affect our mind. We worship God with our mind and so forth. But the more reforms you have as a movement, the more humanity can tend to want to bring someone else into subjection just based upon what you see on the outside. Are you with me? Right? We, we, we don't see outward compliance, so we think there's something wrong with the person. We try to change the person. So young people wrestle with this, and this is just kind of a, an overview of what we'd like to address this evening in a very Christ-centered and redemptive way. I think Mark actually has a definition he'd like to use here that's a a good summation of bad religion. And actually, really quick before I do that, I also just want to reiterate what he's saying. Um, It's easy sometimes when we see people who who are rude, who are unkind as Christians in in promoting some of these reforms and, and, and religion in general in a very unattractive, mean way, it's easy sometimes to look at them and just... Um, almost do the same thing to them that they're doing to us. It's easy to criticize them, to condemn them. And the thing that we have to remember as we, as we go through this and talk about this whole subject, we're not talking about individuals. We can't talk about in- individuals. We can't s- assume that just because a person has acted a certain way or done a certain thing to us, it doesn't mean that they don't love God. It doesn't mean that God isn't doing things in their lives. It means probably that they've been hurt in the past and that they're just sharing that same hurt that they've had. Mm-hmm. And so we need to just be very clear about that in all of this that we're talking about, um, just that hurt people hurt people. And we can't hurt the people that are hurting us because they're hurt. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So um, there's this beautiful picture um, that Ellen White per- portrays of Jesus in the book Steps to Christ. Um, this is pa- from page 12. It says, Jesus did not suppress one word of truth, but he uttered it always, how often? Always in love. He exercised the greatest tact and thoughtful, kind attention in his intercourse with the people. He was never what? Rude, never needlessly spoke a severe word never gave needless pain to a sensitive soul. He did not censure human weakness. Let's just pause there. That's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Like Christ didn't come here and say, oh, you're struggling with that? Oh, oh you're just, you're weak in that? Well, you just, you don't have it all together. No, he was very tender and kind to the people who were struggling, to the people who were battling their own human weakness. He spoke the truth, but always in what? In love. love. 
He denounced hypocrisy, unbelief, and iniquity, but tears were in his voice as he uttered his scathing rebukes. He wept over Jerusalem, the city he loved, which refused to receive him, the way, the truth, and the life. They had rejected him, the Savior, but he regarded them with pitying tenderness. That's so beautiful. His life was one of what? Self-denial and thoughtful care for others. Think about, think about the life of Christ, right? What was he constantly doing for others? Like, he would go days without eating just so that he could teach the multitudes, so he could heal their sick, so that he could help, their, help the things that they were struggling with, right? I mean, he would spend nights in prayer, not for himself, but for, for us, for humanity, for the people around him. So that's just, that's something, this was his life of self-denial and thoughtful care for others. Every soul was precious in his eyes. While he ever bore himself with divine dignity, he bowed with the tenderest regard to every member of the family of God. Think about that. It didn't matter how seemingly insignificant the person was. It didn't matter what, what level of society they were in. He would care for them. Let these, let, just let this picture of Jesus sink into our minds, right? In all men, he saw fallen souls whom it was his mission to save. So let's just think about this. What, what, how could we define and really distill this down into one word, this picture of who Jesus was? Love? Yes. Love, and specifically selfless love, right? You constantly see him caring for people, helping people. And something, too, that we, we have to remember in all this in his love for people, did he just pacify the sin? Did he just, when somebody was sinning, did he just say, oh, just keep sinning, that's okay, because I love you? No, he, he uttered his scathing rebukes, but tears were in his voice, right? This was, this was a, a man, God, who, who cared so much about people that he was willing to help them, that he was willing to, to steer them back into a safe path, right? But in all of that, he exercised an incredible amount of love and selflessness. And his selfless care for them assured people that he loved them, assured people that he cared for them. So when he did say something, when he did point out somebody's sin, it was never rude. And they, they couldn't say that he was just being rude, right? Tact is another word that some might employ here. Jesus was the chief of tact. Yes. So now, let's contrast us. What we're going to do, I, I took the liberty of rewriting this quote and flipped everything around from a different um, angle. And what I'm trying to do here is show what is the difference between how Christ acted with humanity and how, um, how somebody who, well, we'll say bad religionist, how they might address people. Bad religionists do not suppress one word of truth, but they utter them in arrogance. They rarely exercise tact or thoughtful, kind attention in their intercourse with the people. They are rude. They needlessly speak severe words. They give needless pain to sensitive souls. That's big. Like when It's easy sometimes when we see somebody wrestling with something, we see an outward sin of theirs. It's easy sometimes to come in and just think that we have to fix that problem, right? We come in and, and we, we nail them for something, and then afterwards we realize that their mother just died like five months ago, right? That kind of changes things, right? They, they needlessly speak severe words. They give needless pain to sensitive souls. They censure human weakness. They speak the truth, but in self-righteousness. They denounce iniquity and what they suppose to be grievous infractions. No tears are in their voices as they utter their scathing rebukes. They criticize the church and its members who they feel superior to. These people reject them, but the bad religionists regard them with still harsher condemnation. Their lives are lives of little self-denial or thoughtful care for others. I think this is something that's quite significant to note. If we are more interested in making somebody else the picture of what they, we think they should be, then we're interested in caring for their souls and their eternal salvation? I think there's something wrong with that, right? Their lives are lives of little self-denial or thoughtful care for others. Like, 
And this is something that we have to look at in our own lives. Do we, um, are we more intent on helping people? Like, do we spend our days thinking about, okay, how can I help this person? When we see somebody in need, do we care for them? Even if it's just an emotional need, right? Every soul needs to be towing the line a little better in their eyes. They bear themselves with feigned superiority and never bow with tender regard to the lowly members of the family of God. In men, they see fallen souls whom it is their mission to criticize. And again, I want to be careful. This isn't a condemnation of those people, right? I think we can take an honest look at ourselves and find that some of these character traits are in all of us, yeah? Mm -hmm. So this isn't a harsh condemnation of the people that are doing this. This is something that we each need to look at in our own lives and say, how are we? What are we doing in this? How can we grow and be more like Jesus? Yeah, how is it that I address the people around me that I recognize are not maybe towing the line on the outward policies that we have as a church or the reforms that we have as a movement? Do I look at them as someone that's, because I see bad behavior, I assume bad person? Or do I see someone who's struggling, and the only way they're really going to find the help they need is by looking at what's going on in here, right? What we see in, in failed outward deeds and acts of rebellion and so forth is not just someone who's this horrible person. Those are signs to show you that this person is needing help, right? It's outward evidence for you to realize this person needs heart work. And why it says that it was heart work with Christ. Mm -hmm. And so I look at these as invitations to get to know these people, to find ways to build relationships with them, and to find out what is it that's plaguing their hearts and their minds, and how can we point them to Jesus who can heal them. And what I've found is that when people find genuine healing for their heart issues, you'll never believe it. The outward deeds fall by the wayside. Mm -hmm. They no longer have a need to act out because they've finally been healed of their brokenness. Does that make sense? So we're not downplaying outward disobedience. The issue is that's generally not the issue. It's an issue, but it's not the issue. And it's hard work that will help you to decipher what's going on. Can I just quote the quote that you referenced like three times? Yeah, 660? Super... Yeah. Yeah. Desire of Ages 660? Yes. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was hard work with Christ. And if we consent... He will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. Mm -hmm. The will refined and sanctified will find its highest delight in doing his service. Remember, we're not just trying to fix outward actions of a person. That'll never change. That will never do any good. A person can look totally good on the outside, have all, do all the right things, say all the right things, but if the heart isn't with Christ... It doesn't matter, right? Yeah. We have to work for the heart, not just the fruit. Yeah. So the outward things that we see are evidence that something's going on in here. It's an invitation of sorts to find ways to win their trust. So some other examples of bad religion, right? Holy wars, the dark ages, right? We just had a very significant event in the last couple of weeks. Actually, it was this week, uh, October 31st, right? Kind of a, an institutional shift uh, by someone reforming and taking a stand that this is not okay. Right? Depriving people of liberty of conscience in my own church is not okay, Martin Luther said. And this is something we wrestle with um, in all movements. Televangelists, this is a little older, uh, but it still can be an issue. Rich megachurch pastors may be more relevant for today. Uh, judgmental Christians, I'm sure none of us have ever come in contact with those, but just in case I put that one on the list. Being pistol whipped with the spirit of prophecy in scripture, I'm sure this has never happened to you either. And etc. That covers anything else that I didn't list. But just some examples of bad religion. And here's another one. remember hearing someone give a presentation a couple years ago, and they were quoting another evangelist who had asked this question to a group of young people. And the guy said, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word Sabbath, speaking to a group of young people? And one young person raises their hand and says, sit down, shut up, and color." Because what they heard every Sabbath from their parents was to sit down, shut up, and color. So obviously there's a negative word association for this young person and God's holy day that should be a delight, right? It was anything but a delight. It's another example of bad religion, right? Finding every way we can to deprive our children of having fun on Sabbath instead of redirecting their energy to something that's enjoyable but more Sabbath appropriate, yeah? And just how we handle those things makes a big impact on our kids. Now, what was God's ideal plan? Well, in Ezekiel chapter 36, God kind of addresses this, but God's ideal plan was for the nation of Israel 
to be the living, breathing example of how awesome God was. And they were strategically located in this travel corridor where people going from north to south and south to north would come in contact with the Israelites and their teachings, their lifestyles, and their life, the way that they lived their lives was supposed to be immensely attractive to the surrounding nations to realize these people got it together. I want what they've got. The problem is the Israelites kind of really stunk at that. Uh, they felt that the goodness of God was for them, that they were entitled to it. It was rightly theirs because they were the, you know, remnant, if you will, right? Where they're the ones who got it together. Everyone else needs to be like me. Well, here's what ends up happening. In Ezekiel chapter 36, God has this very interesting statement of uh, rebuke to the nation of Israel. Ezekiel chapter 36, and beginning in verse 22. This is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Ezekiel 36, beginning in verse 22. He says, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, I do not do this, what I'm about to do for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you profaned among the nations wherever you went. Immediately there's a problem here. God says, I'm going to have to intervene because my great name has been blasphemed among the nations by the people who claim to know me. Are you with me? So he continues, and says, and I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God. How? I have my Bible. Does anyone else have their Bible? Ezekiel 36, 23, 24. It says, they will know when I'm hallowed in you before their eyes. So they're going to know that God is the Lord when the people of God look like Jesus. And this is precisely God's problem. The very people he chose to evangelize the world, they look nothing like Jesus. So in turn, the surrounding nations want nothing to do with Jesus. Then God makes this beautiful promise that I won't have time to go into, but it's the new covenant. God promises to do for the people what they can't do for themselves. To cleanse them from their unrighteousness, from their idols, to give them a new heart, right? To put his spirit within them and to enable them to obey. So God has promised to reverse the course of the nation of Israel. I have what it takes to undo the bad religion in these folks. And it's an encounter with the gospel in the new covenant. This is what God wants for them. But this is the problem that he has. So this is a big missional quandary for God. That the people of God don't look like him. And so how many people here have a problem with bad religion? Anyone want to fess up to that publicly? I got one. How about you? You got a problem with bad religion? Abuse of religion? Not too many folks. It's okay. It's really awkward. God is raising his hand in Ezekiel 36. I have a huge problem with bad religion. You don't look like me. People want nothing to do with me because of this stuff. Paul, when quoting this verse in Romans chapter 2 and verse 24, goes so far as to say something that wasn't easy to say, I'm sure. Speaking to the church, he says, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And he's speaking to the church. So God is not okay with the abuse of religion, the misrepresentation of him by religious people. It's okay to have a problem with that. God has a problem with it too. The question is, where is the answer found? The answer is found in an encounter with the cross and the new covenant. But I think you've got an example of how Jesus dealt with folks who didn't quite have it together. Indeed. So if you have your Bibles, go to the book of John chapter 8. Here we have a, a story, right? And this, this past year, I've been, I've, I've been listening through the book, The Desire of Ages. And honestly, this has been one of, one of my favorite experiences in all my life, listening through this book. It is so beautiful to see a picture of who Jesus was. It is so beautiful to see his compassion and his, his purity combined, right? So if, if you haven't read that book, or if you haven't listened to it, Totally do it. it. It is so worth it. Um, but in John chapter 8, we see this story, right, where you have, well, we'll just read it in, uh, starting in verse 1, well, verse 2. And early in the morning, Jesus came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. So let's just set the stage, right? Here Jesus comes in. He, he just comes down from the Mount of Olives. He sits down in, in the temple, and then all these people come in, right? And he's teaching them. So the stage is, there's a lot of people here, right? Verse 3, And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, 
And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Imagine, like, think about the ridiculousness of this situation, right? Here Jesus is. He's in the middle of a ton of people. And the religious leaders come in and bring this woman who was literally just caught in adultery, set her literally right in the middle of everyone, and then say, Master, this lady, she was just sinning. She was just caught in adultery in the very act. They stress that point. Talk about bad religion, right? Talk about that. And this is in the temple, too. It's like bringing this lady to church, setting them in the middle of of the sermon and saying, hey, pastor, this lady, look at what she's just doing. That is the epitome of bad religion. Shaming her publicly, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then let's see, how does Jesus handle it? Verse 5, now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have, have a reason to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. So here's, this is so beautiful how, how Jesus does it. He doesn't, because he's faced with kind of a predicament, because in the law it was said that if someone was caught in adultery, they were to be stoned, right? Both of them, by the way. And both parties were in prison. Correct. So, so here's what Jesus does. He doesn't go back and say, oh yeah, scribes and Pharisees, well, let me tell you a laundry list of all your deeds. He doesn't publicly shame them. Does he? No. He stoops down and writes in the ground. And then their consciences convict them when they realize that they are not without sin. That they are guilty of some of the very same things that they're just accusing her of. Right? So let's notice the contrast in this, right? Oh, and then we should continue on uh, in verse 7. So when they continued, or no, uh, verse 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself, he saw none but the woman. He said unto her, Woman, where are your accusers? Is there no man to condemn you? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. This is the epitome of how Jesus dealt with people. He loved them and he showed compassion on them. And notice, in either situation, the scribes or the Pharisees, or the, the scribes and the Pharisees or the woman, in either situation, did he just pacify their sin? Did he just say, Oh, it's okay, scribes and Pharisees, just keep doing what you're doing. Just don't make this a public scene. No. He was intentional about that, but he did it how? In love. With tact. He didn't publicly embarrass them either. Yeah. There's an interesting thing here that the true gospel, you know, generally the, the camps in our church, we've got a left camp and a right camp, right? And I don't mean right and correct. I mean, you know, we've got a conservatives and liberals. One camp seems to have specialized in acceptance, the liberals. Another camp seems to have specialized in accountability, right? That you're accountable to God. These are the things God expects. The others say, hey, you're accepted. Come what may. But the true gospel actually leads to both. That you're accepted and accountable. And this is the way that Jesus deals with this woman, right? He doesn't unleash the fear on her or even on these, these adjectives that could be employed for these group of folks, right, who, who embarrass her and shame her publicly. Jesus doesn't employ shame, right? They're convicted, and guilt is something they're wrestling with, but they're not wrestling with shame. Jesus doesn't shame them publicly. And I think that's just, it's a good model for us as to how we can deal with issues in the church, right? That first of all, we should be speaking with people individually according to Matthew 18. If that doesn't work, you bring someone else with you. But a lot of times what happens in our circles is we just start the gossip mills, right? People start getting blackballed from committee positions and, and being involved in this or being involved in that. Instead of taking the time to actually get to know them, to figure out what brokenness they have and how to minister to their hearts, and three, bring it before individuals. Then one additional party, and then eventually it's brought before the church to deal with something, as opposed to first throw at it, let's throw in front of the entire church body and let's just all devour her, right? Mm -hmm. And they weren't even keeping the laws they should have. Both parties should have been stoned if that was going to happen at all. And they put Jesus in this real quandary, and he handled it like a king, amen? Amen.
I'm so proud of Jesus. I want to share with you today one of my favorite stories in Scripture of redemption from bad religion. It's found in Acts chapter 26. This is a good one to remember. Acts chapter 26, beginning of verse 12. Acts 26, verse 12. I believe this is the third time that Paul is telling his testimony in the book of Acts. So he's telling his story, and he was on his way to Damascus to imprison Christians. And he says, while as I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission from the chief priest, he has a warrant, basically, for these people arrest. At midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my people? Is that what it says? Me. Well, wait a minute. Did he have a warrant for the arrest of Jesus in Damascus? No, but this is the very interesting thing here. Jesus seems to be identifying with the people who are persecuted by religious folks. He seems to be identifying with the Christians who are being persecuted by nearly the same belief system, right? By brethren. He says, no, no, no you're doing this to me, not just them. And when, he'd, when they'd all fall, uh, he says, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. Verse 15. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said again, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. When you're doing it to them, you're doing it to me, he says. And this is really good news because this means that Jesus has nothing to do with bad religion. And you're not the only one who's hurt by it. He's hurt by it when you're hurt by it. And you can say amen to that. This is really good news for us that Jesus identifies with us in these situations. He says, but, and he says, but rise, stand on your feet, for I've appeared to you for this purpose. Notice, Jesus does not blast this guy and say, hey, you're fired. I'm finding someone else. Be out by the end of the week, right? Grab a cardboard box, empty your desk. I'm done with you. I don't like you. I don't want to see you anymore. He says, I've appeared to you for this purpose, purpose to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen, Jesus Christ himself, and of the things which I will yet reveal to you, the gospel. In Arabia, verse 17, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. I think this is amazing. God doesn't condemn him and say, hey, get out of here, buddy. He says, no, 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 no. I see something better in you. I know that what you're doing is inexcusable. It's wrong. It's hurtful. But I'm not going to treat you that way. I'm not going to treat you as this is what you're always going to be. I see something better in you, and I'm going to treat you accordingly. And I think this is great news for us because Jesus deals with him redemptively. He doesn't cast him off. He doesn't disfellowship him. He tells him, I see something better in you. I see you as a champion for the gospel. And he was a champion for the gospel. And here's why he's sending them to other people. To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Just like what he did for Saul. That they may receive the forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. This is fantastic news. No matter how deep and dark someone may be in the midst of their bad religion, God doesn't see them that way. And we shouldn't see them that way. And the church wasn't looking for ways to kill Saul of Tarsus. They were actually praying for him. And this is the answer for us. When we see someone who's knee-deep in bad religion, we should not take what's shared this evening and go back to that elder of my church or go back to this person here or this person there and say, Hey, man. What you're doing is wrong, and here's why. Because these guys said this. That's, you're missing the point entirely if that's what you do. What we need to do is to get on our knees and to pray that this individual has a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus Christ himself. Because when they have an encounter with Jesus Christ himself, everything changes. He had an encounter with the faith of Jesus, which led him to exercise a faith in Jesus, and everything changed. So there is hope for them, but someone's got to be praying. And someone has to be treating them as Jesus would. So remember, he says, turn the other cheek, right? Show kindness to those who spitefully use you and abuse you. So from what I see in this, Jesus has nothing to do with bad religion. And this is really good news for you. Because if you've been hurt by religious people, Jesus is telling you this evening, that wasn't me. They weren't speaking on behalf of me. I have nothing to do with that. In fact, I'm hurt when they hurt you. Jesus hurts in the trenches with you when you're hurt by bad religion. And I hope you can take solace in that this evening. There's good news to be found, and people can be redeemed from this. I want to share something really quick along this line. Um, 
Saul of Tarsus came in, right, and he was very sincere at heart, right? He wanted to he wanted to promote the kingdom of God. He was very sincere and honest in his heart. And I think this is something, too, that we, we really have to remember in these situations in dealing with people who are, who are employing bad religion. Um, there was a situation that I was involved in a while back where um, I had made some mistakes and somebody who was in a position of authority over me dealt with me in a way that really hurt me. Um, there were some things that they did that, like, it, it really caused some very deep scars. Um, and they said them very well-intentioned. They didn't say them because they just wanted to be mean. They didn't say them because they were just rude or whatever. The reality was they were hurting an incredible amount on the inside. Um, they had recently been through some other situations that were even, like, I don't, like, it was really bad, the situations that they had gone through and what people had done to them. And so they were in a situation of incredible heartache themselves. And so their reaction was just to treat me in a way that felt safe to them, mm -hmm. right? So we have to remember this, that um, first of all, we have to recognize where we're hurt. If we have been broken, if we have been hurt by people in the past, that will transfer to how we treat other people. Mm -hmm. And we need to be careful. We need to go to God and receive healing in those areas ourselves. Like, if we have been hurt, we need to ask God to heal our broken hearts. That's what he's promised to do, right? Um, and the other thing to remember, too, is we need to have grace and mercy on the people around us that are doing these rude things. It's the golden rule, right? Regardless of how they're treating us, we need to respond as we wish they would be treated. And Saul was sincere as the day is long. He was not intentionally doing, he thought that he was defending the cause of God. He thought he was standing for truth. And most people who are bad religionists are typically the people that want to stand by the word of God more than other folks in the church, mm -hmm. right? They're wanting to be committed Christians. What they don't recognize is that the way that they're going about it, they have a zeal, but not according to knowledge, Paul says, right? They, they're zealous, but they just don't know how to channel that energy. And they think that if people's deeds will be right, then the people will be right. They just don't know enough yet. Does that make sense? So we need to humanize these folks and not demonize them in this sense. They're very sincere. They just don't understand that the way that they're going about it is wrong. You understand the difference? In zealous, well-intended folks who are just misguided in how they go about it. Um, one other interesting um, lesson that I think we can bring. Um, at, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, right? Or no, no, no. This is a different time. He goes, he's, it's on Sabbath. And somebody is hurt, and so he heals them, right? I think it was a withered hand or something along those lines. And he heals a hand. And then the religious leaders, the Jews, come to him, and like they were totally berating him for healing somebody. Then they were so incensed by the fact that he broke the Sabbath that they then went and plotted murder on the Son of God on Sabbath. Do you see the hypocrisy and the contradiction in that? Um, this is something, too, that we, we have to be very careful of. Um, Sometimes we can be so engulfed and enwrapped in what we deem to be a certain way that we can be completely blind to what we're actually doing, hmm. right? The Jews, they didn't think that they were killing the Son of God. But why was it? Why, why, why did they, what led them to the point where they were so blinded that they were willing to kill the Son of God? This, the answer is, the simple answer is, it was in the small decisions of their lives. It was in the little compromises that they made with self. The little prides they indulged, indulged right? It was the little things that, that they hung on to, those little sins, that before long they had become so accustomed to cherishing their pride and their sin that they would rather do away with the person that, whose life condemned their unrighteous life than to admit that they had sinned. Hmm. Right? That, more than anything else, can lead us into bad religion. Hmm. There's another story with Paul where Paul kind of gives his background and his pedigree and some of the lessons that he learned. Uh, I want to have Mark cover this, but I wanted to say something real briefly when it comes to it's easy to get frustrated with bad religion, and Paul himself wrestled with this with the language he uses, beginning in verse 1. I, I guess I'll read it, but I'll let you kind of give some commentary on it. But Philippians 3, beginning in verse 1. 
He says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. And any parents can vouch for this, right? It seems like our instruction to our children, our instruction to the people we're leading, kind of falls on deaf ears the first time. He doesn't feel bad about saying it a second time. He wants to make sure that they get it. But then listen to what he says. This is the name he gives to the bad religionists of his day. He says, Beware of dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the mutilation, meaning those who are pushing for circumcision. But then he says, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet I indeed also, or I, indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. So another way, another way that you could say this, Brother Paul over here is a fifth generation Adventist. He's grown up in the church went to um, the church school, the local church school, then went to the local academy. He spent all his life eating fried chick. Um, he, was, he went to the Adventist colleges. He knew he could repeat the 28 fundamental beliefs verbatim. Like this brother knew his stuff, right? He was the, um, he was the epitome of what a good Christian looked like. This is significant to note. It's not just the people that look like mean people that can be mean Christians. Mm -hmm. sometimes, it's, sometimes it's the people who are, look like the very best people on the outside. And that's not an invitation to criticize them. That's an invitation for us who think that we're okay to look at ourselves and say, am I being Paul? Right. Am I being the Pharisees. My, my lineage, my pedigree doesn't entitle me to treat anyone differently than Jesus would. I'm no better than them, right? I was baptized seven years ago, right? I'm a first generation Adventist. I'm a newbie. When I taught in an academy, my students have been Adventists longer than I had. Um, but that does not mean that just because someone doesn't grow up in our movement or go through Adventist schools, that they're less than us, Right? God does not have grandchildren. God only has children. And that means that we each individually have to have an experience with Jesus. I don't care if you were baptized by Mark Finley, Ted Wilson, and HMS Richards, right? If I don't have a heart relationship with Jesus, none of it matters. And this is what Paul says. Even though I had all this stuff, I counted all but lost for Christ. I need what I really need, and that's a face-to-face -face encounter and a living, breathing relationship with Jesus, Period. That's our only means of having any worth because we have his merits, mm. not creating our own. Mm. Now, people are not rejecting Jesus for who he is, or, or particularly God the Father for who he is. They're rejecting him for who he's portrayed to be, right? You can't watch a documentary in the life of Jesus and at the end just say, you know, I just, I just don't know about this guy. Right? It's not possible. Jesus was an immensely attractive person. Mm. Even Gandhi wrestled with this. Now, I want to read a quote here, and I'm going to be fair. It's debated whether these are the exact words that Gandhi used or not, but his life lives out this story nonetheless. So I'm going to use it for that reason. But he said, I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And then he goes on to say, I'd be a Christian if it were not for the Christians. Now, we laugh, but whenever people are killing Christians, just like Saul of Tarsus, they're doing it in two ways. They're causing people to leave who were Christians. Hmm. And two, people who were considering being Christians decide, you know what? Y'all can keep it. I'm not interested. Hmm. I'm from Southern Illinois, which is why we both employ that fantastic grammar. And neither of us went to college, so we can get away with anything. Um, but here's why this matters. Gandhi heard about the teachings of Jesus, and they were immensely attractive to him. And so he goes to a Christian church in India. And he also had a horrible experience of living with some Christians in South Africa. But I want to give a big disclaimer. I'm friends with some South Africans, and I think they're amazing people. I have nothing against South Africans. I just want to make sure that's abundantly clear. 
But anyway, he had a bad experience there. But two, he attended this church in India and this elder makes a beeline for him at the door and says, you are not welcome here. Now, I hope you don't have any greeters like that at this church. I'm sure you don't. Um, but this is what he runs into. Not even just like, you smell like cigarette smoke, maybe you're at the wrong place. Like, no, this guy chases him down and says, you are not welcome here because we have a caste system in India and you're not part of this caste and you're not white. And so Gandhi leaves. And he has this situation where he can say, I would have been a Christian were it not for the Christians. But what we're going to close with this evening will deal with this. Because regardless of how Christians treat you, you can't show up to Jesus on Judgment Day and say, hey man, like I would have been a believer, but you just got some terrible followers. Mm. He's not going to ask you, what did you do about them? He's going to ask you, what did you do about me? Mm. Did you taste and see that the Lord is good? Have you sought for yourself to see whether this is true or not? We're not going to get away with that on Judgment Day and just say, hey, I met some really gnarly Christians, but it turns out you were awesome. And... I'm in, right? Like, no, you need to make your own decision. You need to see for yourself whether Jesus is awesome. And this is where Gandhi failed. He didn't taste and see for himself that the Lord was good. You have anything on that before I move to the quote? Okay. This quote you need to write down in 47-point font in whatever you have in front of you right now. But the reference is at the end. I usually do this in a week of prayers with academy students. They, and they think it's the coolest thing in the world that Ellen White says this. Ellen White speaking... Nothing frightens me more than to see the spirit of variance manifested by our brethren. Notice, not Babylonians, not Republicans and Democrats, mm. our people. We are on dangerous ground when we cannot meet together like Christians and courteously examine controverted points. I feel like, the prophet of God speaking, I feel like fleeing the place lest I receive the mold of those who cannot in candidly investigate the doctrines of the Bible. Those who cannot impartially examine evidences of a position that differs from theirs are not fit to teach in any department of God's cause. This is when you say amen really loud. Ellen White was so frustrated with the way in which people were communicating one with another. Her on the same team were Seventh-day Adventists, were brethren. And yet we're at each other's jugulars over peripheral issues. And it's childish and we should repent. This is not the way that God's people should operate. And it really bothered her. And I like the fact that she says this because I'm sure many of us can resonate with the same thing. Most of our dialogues immediately jump into, are you one of us or are you one of them? And I think Jesus would respond like the angel of the Lord with Joshua. No. <laughs> Wait, are, are you for us or against us? And his response is, no. That's not the issue, right? So, we're brethren. We need to find ways to work together in these things. Now, the danger that we face as a church is that the way in which we communicate with each other, you'll never believe this, um, the world is watching. And our children are watching. And they don't have a whole lot of interest. If you look into the statistics of how our young people are staying in our church, um, they're not. Why? Because they're running into issues like this. They're seeing fellow church members run each other down over peripheral issues, right? You go to some of our Adventist websites, I was going to say Republican and Democrat. It's the same thing. We're drinking their Kool-Aid. We're just bringing it to our, our premises. But with, with conservatives and liberals, that we're tearing each other's hearts out in public forums, mm. Right? We, we got the conservative websites, the liberal websites, and church publication websites. And if people are going to write their articles from their perspective, they can do that. Free press, it is what it is. But be tactful. Be like Jesus. What I really have a problem with, and what God has a problem with, and what our children have a problem with, and what the world has a problem with, is the comment sections. And it's sinful. We're cannibals on these websites. I don't know if you're aware of this, but we're health reformers. Humans are not in Leviticus 11. They're not approved for human consumption. We're supposed to be vegetarians. If you can't have civil discourse without chewing somebody alive on the internet, we need to pray. If your religious experience causes you to lose your religion when talking to other religious people about religion, it's not a religion worth having. And we need to do some self-examination. And I'm passionate about this, as you can tell, because I'm having to mop up the mess from this foolishness. The world is watching. How we communicate matters. 
And if you can't talk like Jesus, when you're talking about Jesus, you need to find Jesus. Amen? Put that on Facebook, somebody, would you? All right, I'm moving on from that. Go ahead. So I want to share a quote right now that I think really epitomizes what we're dealing with here. Um, this is from Testimonies to Ministers 363.2. Sorry, it's not up there. I pulled this one at the last minute because something he said reminded me of it. The righteousness of Christ by faith has been ignored by some. Okay, let's just, let's just think about this context before we go on. She's saying this specifically in the context that some have ignored the truth of the righteousness of Christ by faith. Okay, so the antidote for the rest of this is this right here, not ignoring the righteousness of Christ by faith. The righteousness of Christ by faith has been ignored by some, for it is contrary to their spirit and their whole life experience. Rule, rule has been their course of action. Satan has had an op opportunity of representing himself. When one who professes to be a representative, of, a representative of Christ engages in sharp dealing and in pressing men into hard places, those who are thus oppressed will either break every fetter of restraint or they will be led to regard God as a hard master. They cherish hard feelings against God and the soul is alienated from him just as Satan planned it should be. Guys, this should be an intense warning for us. Are we pushing people into hard places? Are we dealing sharply with people? When, when we see that young person in our church, are we sharply criticizing them for something that they're doing? Are, are we pressing our children? I don't have children, but are we pressing our, our young people into hard situations where, where they feel like just to, to somehow be good, they have to give up everything that you're criticizing them for, right? We have to be so careful about this because Satan represents himself in those things. Yeah. As much as we aren't trying to do that, as much as we're trying to, to help them, we can actually be doing the exact opposite. Yeah, heavy-handed heavy religion leads to the French Revolution. And the typical response we get from our young people is, if this is what God is like, I'm not interested. Well, the problem is that's not what God is like, but how are they going to find out? They've already left. And so when someone asks them to come back to God, the God they think they're going to have to come back to is this monster that they've been introduced to by misrepresentation by people who claim to know God. Bad religion. Go ahead. Let me just say one thing. The reason I think that we're so passionate about this is because we've experienced it in our own lives and we've seen it in a lot of other people's lives. Yeah. We've seen a lot of people, especially young people, who are either out of the church now or who are in the church and really struggling because of this. I have a friend that I was talking to today that, like, they're they're dealing with a lot of very heavy baggage because of stuff like this. Yeah, this is no joke. This actually causes people to be invalid spiritually. We know a kid that we used to teach that this kid is just an absolute invalid. Literally, like emotionally and psychologically, he has become an invalid. He can't function well because of this heavy-handed dealing. And again, th these are the folks who are sincere. They want God to be honored. They want good things to happen in the church. But the approach is woefully wrong. You understand the difference? And if we recognize the sincerity and we humanize the person who's doing these things, it actually moves us to have sympathy for them, not antipathy, right? If that's even good grammar, I don't know. But anyway, it keeps us from being up, you know, angry at them. We come to, we can actually feel sorry for them. This person is doing this because they themselves are broken. You understanding? Many of us will teach in the way that we were taught. So even though we may want to do the right thing, we may be regurgitating the wrong method because that's just how we were taught. And I just want to make sure that's clear. Now, why does this matter? Well, the church was preparing for a national Sunday law crisis in the year 1888. After the general conference session, it was an absolute debacle uh, for a few reasons. I'll make this very, very brief. But the Long Galatians was the political powder keg of the day that just soured the whole conference. You're in this camp or you're in this camp, right? It's the moral law or the ceremonial law. And if you're not on our side, don't listen to their sermons. Don't read their blogs. Don't go to their website. Don't have anything to do with them because they're not one of us right? This led to a really difficult situation in the church. Well, we're dealing with that again. The political hot topic has changed, but the spirit of variance from one camp to the other is exactly the same. It's just a new topic, right? And it's, it's along Galatians chapter 2. But what God was doing to prepare people to stand in the day of God when the Sunday law crisis was about to take place was the message of Christ our righteousness and liberty of conscience. 
These were the two legs of the message that God wanted to take to the world to ensure that people could stand. Well, Christ our righteousness is something that we should be preaching from the mountaintops regularly. There's not a thing that needs to be preached upon more... There's not a subject that needs to be dwelt upon more earnestly, repeated more frequently, or established more firmly in the minds of all yeah. than the impossibility of fallen man meriting anything by his own best good works. Yes. Period. Salvation is by faith through Jesus Christ alone. This message has to go to the world. I use him as my reference tool. Um, even yeah. when he's sitting in the audience, I still use him. It's true. And, but the other thing was liberty of conscience. And here's where this matters with us, and we're almost done. Regardless of how we may feel about someone and what they're doing, we still have to give them the opportunity to make their own choice. Mm. And sometimes our zeal for them to act differently, to look differently, to do differently, we actually deprive them of one of the fundamental components of the gospel, liberty of conscience. Even Lucifer had to be permitted to do what he did. Now he has to be isolated and so forth. I'm not saying that we don't have rules. I'm not saying that we don't have policies. I'm not saying that we don't have you know, church disciplinary measures as, as, as a body that we need to work through. But most of these are not disfellowshipable situations, right? They brought chicken to potluck, right? It's something, I'm, not that I would recommend doing that, but it, regardless, you understand what I'm saying. Like it, it, this is not a, a, a disfellowshipable offense, right? This is not a test question, as Ellen White would phrase it, whatever the situation may be. And so when we deprive our young people of the ability to make their own decisions, what we don't seem to realize, and our fellow members, is that we're actually preparing them to fall in the Sunday law crisis when we do this. Because they're never able to use their own reasoning faculties to process, this is wrong, this is why I should make a right decision. It's, you better do this or I'm going to get on your case. You better do this or you're in trouble. Well, we're literally programming people to obey to avoid trouble. Well, what do you do when an image is erected on the plain of Dura and the federal government and the military speaks louder than a present truth preacher or your parents? Hmm. You're going to do the same thing you've been doing your whole life. Obey to stay out of trouble. Hmm. Liberty of conscience matters, people. It matters a lot. So we don't want to control people. We don't want to coerce people. That's Revelation 13. God doesn't work that way. What God does is informs people out of love and invites them to respond. This is the difference between Revelation 13 and Revelation 14. Now, we can have tactful conversations with people and saying, hey, this is a public open thing and I'm concerned. Is everything okay? Mm. Right? I don't just want to assume that you're in wholesale rebellion right now, but I do see some things that concern me. Mm. Is everything going okay? And start talking through the process, but we can't deprive people of their ability to choose. It's so, so important to us as a movement, particularly with our young people, that we're fattening these precious young folks for slaughter. We think we're protecting our children. We're actually preparing them to fall because we never taught them to self-govern. Mm -hmm. Type self-governance in the Ellen White app. She talks about it a lot in education and in the home setting. We have to teach them to reason, to make their own decisions, and we should give them those freedoms when they're under our care so we can give them discipline, so we can give them discourse, so that when they leave the nest, they can finally handle it. But if all they've been doing is being a mere reflector of the thoughts of those around them, well, what happens when they go and live in the world? They reflect the thoughts of the people around them. They don't know how to function for themselves, and I see this a lot from folks, and, and then your kid, the, the kids just end up going off the deep end, mm. and you hear this exact line from nearly every parent. I raised them so much better than this. Mm. They knew what right and wrong were. They were told what to do and what not to do, but they were not given the ability to strengthen their own reasoning faculties to make their own decisions. You understand the difference? We think we raise them better than that, but we never train them to make their own decisions. They need those freedoms in our own home so that we can still work with them, right? You don't give them freedom when they leave your home. You give them freedom while they're home and cultivate and strengthen that ability while they're in your care. Amen? It's a really important gospel premise. Let me just interject something here really quick too. In all of this, this is not to say that we never address the sin in a person's life. Right. Okay? We need to make that distinction clear because in, in our efforts sometimes to not be a bad religionist, it's easy to hop over into the other camp of, oh, well, you know what, I'm just going to let them do whatever they want to and it's totally okay. I just, I don't want to push them away from God. Right. There is, a, like, look at how Christ dealt faithfully with people. Even, even John the Baptist, 
I mean, he dealt, because he dealt faithfully with, with Herod, his head was chopped off. Like, we have to remember this too, that there does come times when God asks us, especially people in religious, in religious leadership roles or in parental roles, God does ask people to go and address the, the sins and errors in people's lives. But it's all in how you do it yep. and when you do it. And, and if we don't love that person more than we love our own lives, then we're not really in the best place to address them on some of these things, right? If we just want to criticize them and, 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 and condemn them, we're not going in the right spirit. We have to go in the spirit of, I love you, I want to see you in the kingdom, and I want to do this in the way that is the most effective to reach you. And that takes getting to know them. Yes. You have to spend time with someone long enough to know how they operate. And you can realize, you know, their parents were very controlling. And if I come towards them with something that sounds like condemnation, they're going to freak. We, we need to labor for their hearts, right? We need to get to know them, how they operate, what the best way is to communicate with them. That takes time. That's why we don't do it. It's hard and it takes time. Discipleship isn't easy. That's why we failed at it for years. Public meetings are great. But if you don't keep investing in these people before, during, and after, you'll never believe it. A year later, they're gone. Why? Because we didn't labor for their hearts. We just wanted to change their ideas. Mm -hmm. We need to labor for their hearts continually. Now, I want to close with this last thought here. In John chapter 17 and verse 3, Jesus says, And this is eternal life. And notice he doesn't say perfect church attendance, perfect church attire, perfect dietary laws. And it's not that any of these things are bad. They're not. But if you're thinking that this is the end goal of what Jesus wants, just outward compliance, you've missed the whole point. The whole point of any of these reforms was what he actually says. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The whole goal for us is to have a living, breathing, vibrant relationship with Jesus. To know him for ourselves, to know God for ourselves, so that when there comes a time we think that everyone has abandoned us, we're still going to stand for him because we know him. We know him better than that. We know his character. This is what kept Jesus in Gethsemane, and it's what's going to keep us as a people in our dark moments. This is the end goal, that we may know God for ourselves. And so when you've had to deal with bad religion, Jesus is asking you to think for yourselves today and to not let those people think for you. Don't leave God because you met a bad Christian. You owe it to God to find out for yourself whether he's actually who he claims to be or not. And that takes investigation. But the rewards far outweigh the risk when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? But you got to give them a chance. So if you've been abused by religious people and you're just counting the days until you turn 18 so you can walk or something else, what if God wasn't like that? What if this person doesn't actually represent Jesus as they ought? What if it's better? This is the reason I do this whole series at Week of Prayers for Schools. What if God and religion were infinitely better than we ever imagined? Well, the only way you're going to find out is if you take Jesus at his word. And if you seek for yourself to know him, instead of just adopting someone else's religion or rejecting someone else's religion. I can't take Mark's oil, according to the parable of the foolish virgins. I can't take his oil. I've got to have my own. You can't take your parents' oil. you got to have your own. You can't take your pastor's oil, the elder's oil, or the bad religionist oil, whether you want it or not. You have to have your own experience with Jesus when it all comes down to it. This is what we have to do. Jesus deserves at least that. He deserves an invest. If he's willing to give all, the least you can do is investigate. If you're not interested, you can walk. He gives you that option. But at the bare minimum, take the time to see and taste for yourself that God is indeed good. And we've actually kind of dealt with this. Yeah, really. but I just want to put one more thing in here. Oh, this is your slide. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Um, and I'll close with the story after this. Yeah. So how do we deal with this? And I know he just talked about that somewhat, but I also want to take it from a little bit different angle. If we are in the situation of being the bad religionist, Let's take a look at Jesus. Let's immerse ourselves in the beauty of God. Let's immerse ourselves in the beauty of who Jesus was. Let's, let's read through the Gospels. Read through the, the desire of ages. Take a good long look daily at Jesus. And, and I know this is something that it's like, I, I hated this subject for a long time because it, it always just brought me to really a dark place of fear. But 
we also have to be willing to look at, take a good, honest look at where we are actually in our own hearts. Mm-hmm. Paul says to prove your own selves and test to see whether you are in the faith. We need to have a good, honest look, not only at Jesus and his beauty, but we also have to say, okay, where am I at with God? What, what are the decisions that I've compromised and where, where have I left God? And when we start to address those areas and let the grace of God transform and cleanse our lives, we'll find that he will start to heal those areas in our lives and make us better, more kind to people. Or let's say that we're in the position of being treated bad by bad religionists. Instead of just throwing out the baby with the bathwater, you know what? I know it, it, their criticism may be difficult to hear. Maybe it, be, it might be totally unchristlike, but it might be correct. So instead of just pushing yes. them away, oh, say, point. okay, maybe I need to take an honest look as the bigger person and say, is this something in my life that I do need to correct? Amen. Um, and then let's also say, you know what? I don't like this, but I don't think this is what God is like. I want to take a look at Jesus. So if, you've, if you're wrestling because people are treating you poorly, go to Jesus. Find him. Find the beauty of a Savior that will totally surpass any ugly picture of God that you've ever seen. It's amazing how good God can look when we actually look at him and not at the people misrepresenting him. Yeah, Jesus actually went so far as to say that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We can roll with Jesus, most of us, because we see what he did. But the Father's a mystery to us. And a lot of times we project our unbelief in ourselves upon God. We project other people's unbelief in us upon God, and we assume that he looks at me the way that I look at me and the way that they look at me. He doesn't. And Jesus says that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So if you're willing to give Jesus a chance, one of the most profound truths of Scripture is that God the Father is just like Jesus. Mm -hmm. Just like him. He's a perfect express image of his Father. Um, Mark made a fantastic point, and, and that can't be made enough. Just because someone offers you censure and you don't like the way that it happens doesn't mean that that's not an issue in your life. And the issue with Saul of Tarsus was no man could have reasoned with him. No one would have convinced him. It took him having an encounter with Jesus Christ himself for him to change. So what we need to be doing is praying that they would have that. Amen? Now, I want to close with a story. So... Uh, Some of you may be familiar with Ty Gibson's testimony. He grew up in a very violent home. Now, his mom put a stop to it immediately whenever he was assaulted by his dad. But what ended up happening was he he recognized that this is not... How could there possibly be a God of love when I live in a circus, when I live in an abusive environment? He wasn't okay with that. But what ends up happening is Ty has his mom sit him down while he's a kid. She can just see that Ty is distant. Ty is not fully engaged. He's not fully there. And she sits him down one day. She says, Ty, we need to talk. He's not doing well in school. She sits him down and says, Ty, we need to talk. And she sits down across from Ty, and she's real close to his face, and she has something in her hand. And she says, Ty, I need to tell you something. And then she says, Ty, so-and-so is not your dad. Now just imagine, your whole life is hell because of dad. Your dad is ruining your life. He's physically abusing your mother regularly. And it's just a madhouse in your home. And this is all dad's fault. And then mom literally says, so-and-so is not your dad. What do you mean? He's always been dad. And she turns around what she has in her hand, and it's a picture of a teenage boy. She says, this is your dad. His name is so-and-so, something-something Gibson. And she says, we were kids. We were teenagers. We were just kids. We didn't know any better. And I got pregnant, he was scared, and he ran. But he never did this to me. He never hit me. He never called me these names. He never did any of these things. And she said, Ty, you have to know this. That was not your dad. This is your dad, and he would never do that to you. Young people and adults present, this is your dad. He would never do this to you. He's not like that. Those who have hurt you and abused you in the name of religion or other places, Jesus is nothing like that. He would never do that to you. Amen? Never. If you've been hurt by people in religious settings, Jesus has nothing to do with that. And he hurts with you when you're hurt. And you need to know that this evening. So if you've been wrestling with hanging into this whole God thing because it's just been a mess, 
you can come back. You can come back today and you can choose to see for yourself that God is exactly who he claims to be. Love. Long-suffering. Merciful and inviting. Does he excuse sin? No. But he offers you something better than sin. He meets us at our wells when we're running from God and escaping from the people around us. When the woman at the well in John 4 is just trying to use this, her water pot was her means of escape from her problems in her life. And those are the times when Jesus comes looking for us. He says he had to go through Samaria in John 4. Shows up and he tells the woman, I have something better to offer you than you're coming here for. If bad religion has put you on the run and you're looking at other areas, Jesus has something better to offer you this evening. Amen? That's good news for us. It's real good news. You can give him another chance. Mark, would you close in prayer for us? Anything else? Yeah, let's pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you that you are our Father. Lord, we thank you that you're a good Father. That, Lord, whatever bad examples we've had in our lives of, of people who have misrepresented you, God, we thank you that you're not like that, Amen. that you're good, that you're kind, that you're loving, that you're compassionate, that you're, you're full of pity and compassion for us. Lord, even in our weakest, most helpless, sinful state, God, that you, you invite us to come to us just as we are, sinful, helpless, and dependent. God, you know there are people in this room tonight that have, Lord, have wrestled with one of these two sides of things, maybe have been in both scenarios. And God, I just want to ask that you will place a burden on the hearts of each person, Lord, that whatever they may be wrestling with, God, that they will come to you and and choose to look to you. They'll choose to to follow you, to choose to, to behold you and not the sin that they see around them. God, we just pray in a special way that you'll convict and convert each of our hearts, Lord. Lord, we all need you so desperately. Lord, give us the grace, the mercy, the compassion, the tenderness on those around us that you have on us. Lord, we just pray for these gifts. We pray that, Lord, none of us will leave you because of the misrepresentation of you. Lord, we lay our lives before you and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.